Hello again, everybody. This is Dave Reynolds from the Peoria Journal Star Sports Department, welcoming you to another edition of the Journal Star Podcast. Our guest today, all-time Bradley great, Roger Fagley. Thanks for joining us, Roger. Glad to be here. Thanks, Dave. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover here. You you had a great career as a Brave and then on to the NBA after that. And I think you played a year in France after that. Did, yes. So um, maybe we'll just start to... Uh, with Bradley, and uh, you arrived there in 1974. Um, quite a story. Um, you came as a baseball player and uh, ended up as a basketball player. That's correct. Uh, I had a pretty good high school pitching career. East Peoria that year went to the, uh, the the final game of the state tournament. As it happened, it rained that spring so much that uh, with the pitching rules and the number of innings you could pitch, we had enough rain in between games that there was the time frame needed to let me pitch again the next game. So I pitched every game throughout the state tournament, including the semifinal game, mm-hmm. and then uh, came in in relief in a championship game, even at the at the in the last inning or two. But uh, that gave me a lot more notoriety for baseball probably than basketball. Mm-hmm. I was recruited to Bradley by Chuck Bisher. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I was offered a contract by the Cincinnati Reds, and I went to a Pittsburgh Pirate tryout. But the Reds were actually in my parents' living room on the uh, Sunday night prior to me having already, or after already enrolling at Bradley, signing the letter of intent. Mm -hmm. And I was just waiting to go to school Monday morning. And Sunday night they came in at their last pitch to uh, sign me and send me to Billings, Montana. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, it just didn't seem right, so I said no thanks and went to bed. Got up the next morning and went back to Bradley for, or went to Bradley for my first class, which then makes you ineligible to play baseball until your class graduate or you mm-hmm. get an associate's degree. Mm-hmm. But anyway, throughout the process over the summer, Coach Bish said, "Why don't you?" hang out with the basketball guys, stay in shape for fall baseball. Mm -hmm. And uh, they always need somebody to beat up on. And uh, I became that punching bag that summer and enjoyed playing with them, got to know the guys pretty well. And uh, the long story short was I keep telling people I wasn't smart enough to know that I shouldn't come back because (laughs) we played in the old Hewitt Hall over the summer. Mm -hmm. And then when school started, we did move to the field house and – once again, nobody told me not to come back. Mm-hmm. There was always gear in my locker when I went over. And uh, all of a sudden, one day, coach set us down and said, uh, this is going to be our roster this year. And so I became a basketball player <laughs> without yeah. really trying to be a basketball player. And was that kind of your preference? Did you did you like basketball more than baseball or, or I, not? I liked them both. Yeah, yeah I, I really did like them both. I was thrilled to think I could still play, you know, two sports. Mm -hmm. And I did. I played baseball for three years, a little less ceremoniously than basketball, but Mm -hmm. uh, I I played because I enjoyed playing. Mm -hmm. And you were a pitcher in baseball, and did you have an okay career as a pitcher in college? Uh, I don't. It was okay, I guess. I mean, it's it's hard. You know, uh, baseball in in college starts in – February or so, mm-hmm. working out in, in the Midwest, working out indoors, and then pitchers are throwing and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, being as involved as I was in basketball from my freshman year on, I did not participate in any of that. I mean, I was in better shape than all the ba- baseball sure. guys when, sure. once I got finished with basketball. But baseball playing wise, especially for a pitcher, I was, you know, I was three months behind. Yeah. So yeah. when the team would leave to go on the spring trip, usually to New Orleans back then. Mm-hmm. You know, I was pitch uh, playing catch and pitching for the first time that year. So, and they were playing games. So, we were always fifteen or twenty games into the season before I was ready to even participate. And what a basketball career you had! Uh, we are reminded every time we step into Carver Arena and look up in the rafters and see number 45 hanging there. I keep looking, too. <laughs> make sure they don't take it down. <laughs> One of six, I think, Bradley uniforms that have been retired, and uh, that's yeah. quite an honor in oh, itself. Isn't tremendous it? honor. Yeah. You know, I grew up in East Peoria, and I saw Bradley games since the time I was three years old. I mean, I saw Chet Walker play and 
just about Joe Allen and mm-hmm. everybody in between and loved going to the games. And I, by the time I got to high school, I actually, you know, I think I still have an all-time free throw percentage record at Bradley, but mm-hmm. I, I truly believe I got there because when I was in high school, I was a very good free throw shooter. Mm-hmm. And the reason I worked at it was because we would get, there would be two two tickets to a Bradley game available on game nights for us at East Peoria. And uh, Coach Cruiser at the time would give those to the guys who shot the best free throws okay. at the end of practice. So I worked on it, and I went to almost all the games, and, uh, and it just became a thing. Quite the incentive, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I find it yeah. pretty annoying to watch guys miss free throws now. <laughs> I'm sure. Eight. 55, I think, was your career free throw percentage, which, as you mentioned, still stands number one in the on the in the Bradley record books. So, that's 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 pretty awesome. I think that's. I think I had eight records at one time, and mm-hmm. you know they've all been broken, which is what happens as uh, players get better and teams get better and and all that. So that's fine. But I remember James Gillingham was uh, on the verge of breaking that record mm-hmm. also, mm-hmm. and in like the last three games, he shot like. Eight for sixteen or yeah, eight for eighteen from that. the free throw line. Yeah. I'm thinking, whoa, there's a higher power <laughs> here that wants to at least keep my name in the book somewhere. Yeah, and then when you left Bradley, you were the all-time leading scorer, um, first player to ever to score more than two thousand points on the hilltop. Four years later, Mitchell Anderson uh, uh, passed his number one, and then uh, six years after that, Hersey Hawkins uh, passed both of you. Yeah, but you're still number three, so that's yeah. after all these years. That's, that's saying quite a bit. Well, it is, and you know that's that's a tribute. I mean, I I could shoot and put the ball in the basket, but to do that, to score in numbers like that, you've got to have help from your teammates, and mm-hmm. I certainly did. And Coach Stoll was. Pretty instrumental in that also, you know, running specific plays for me to get the ball in specific spots. And, mm-hmm. and it all just kind of fit together, and that was by far my best contribution to the team was to score. And so a lot of the offense was set up for me to get opportunities to do mm-hmm. that. I want to run through just some of your accomplishments um, at Bradley. Um, third team All-America by the Associated Press then UPI your senior year. Um, as a junior, the Valley Conference Valley Player of the Year, you averaged 27.4 points a game. As a senior, you averaged a little higher, 27.6, but you finished second to a guy named Larry Bird for the Valley Player of the Year. Um, the uh, I mentioned the leading, leaving the schools in the number one scorer and number one free throw percentage shooter. Um, 15 30-point games at Bradley and 46 points in that memorable 107 to 106 loss to number four ranked UNLV. That had to have been, aside from the loss, it had to have been a fun game to play in. That was uh, a tremendous game. Not a lot of defense, obviously, because that, <laughs> that was in regulation, too. There was no overtime there. <laughs> right. But uh, it was a great game. I walked down the street today and people still – course now I scored 60 or 70 or so <laughs> and I just nod yeah, yeah. it's a good game wasn't it sure <laughs> I think the most frustrating yeah. frustrating thing about that was that uh, after that was over uh, you're talking about UNLV they went to Illinois State and Illinois State beat them in uh, Horton mm-hmm. Fieldhouse mm-hmm. and I think you know as a rivalry between Bradley and Illinois State that just because we knew we wore them out and then they, right. they were able to beat them sure <laughs> And that was pre Valley days for the for the Redbirds, wasn't That's right. it? That's right. Yeah. Yes, it was. But there was still a rivalry brewing yeah. at that time. Yeah, you know they used to play a, a tournament where Illinois State and Bradley, and then Eastern and Western would get together for okay. a little for a little round robin tournament, and okay. that, that always created a lot of interest or, or, around the state. And, yeah. And then uh, we played Illinois uh, Wesleyan when Jack Sigma was there and Jim Molinari was there, and we only played them once, I think, but. Uh, mm-hmm. They thought they were pretty good that year, and they were. Mm-hmm. We beat them in Peoria, and then uh, yeah. we never made a return trip over there. But uh, games like that are great, I think, to create mm-hmm. interest locally. And Tell me a little bit about the progression of your career. You started out as a freshman. Um, you averaged like eight points a game. 
um, weren't a key guy on the team, but that next year as a sophomore, I think you averaged 17, you were you were more of a forward at that time, right? I was. Uh, my freshman year, uh, I was basically third in line to be a forward, and uh, Mark Doner got hurt, sprained an ankle, was out a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. and so I was the odd man out, so I got a chance to, to play, and... Mm-hmm. You know, I think a little skinny kid from East Peoria that nobody had ever heard of before. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I get guarded by maybe their fourth or fifth best defender <laughs> as opposed to one of their better defenders. Sure. And uh, got some opportunity to shoot. And like I said, I've always had a, an ability to score. So when mm-hmm. I got my opportunities, I was I was able to produce a little bit mm-hmm. here and there. And, and uh, from there, it just kind of progressed to my sophomore year. Now, obviously – a regular full time and uh and uh things worked out well. I was progressing, getting better, you know, I got stronger and mm-hmm. and better for as a matter of fact, which I give a lot of credit to Coach Stoll for. Mm-hmm. To me it seems like back then the coaching was more of trying to Im- improve players. Today recruiting seems to be recruit the best guys out there mm-hmm. and if you can get the best ones you're probably going to have a better chance to win mm-hmm. but back then we did a lot of f- drills fundamentally uh, a lot of shooting practice a lot of free throw practice basic stuff that uh, really helped me grow as a player and um was it a matter of having more opportunity as a sophomore was that part of it too that kind of improved your game yeah, and more confidence, yeah. not only on my part, but probably more confidence from my teammates, too. Sure. Yeah. And then um, going into your junior year, Coach Stoll decided to make you a shooting guard. Right. Um, which, um, how did you take to that? At that time, there weren't many six, seven shooting guards in, in uh, well, the country. So that is correct. Uh, that, uh, and that was an advantage. Mm-hmm. And uh, I knew I needed to be a guard a lot more skill with the ball handling so I really tried mm-hmm. to work on that and I'm sure that was probably the one of the weaker parts of my game was the, the ball handling mm-hmm. um, but we always had good point guards to play with Bob Humbles made a tremendous sacrifice moving from the shooting guard position to the point guard position and handling the ball a lot more mm-hmm. and so that and, and he could still score too and uh, there was a time when the two of us were the leading guard combo in the nation for scoring and Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of that's a tribute to him. But being six seven or so, when there weren't a lot of six seven guards around, you know, I was probably a pretty difficult matchup defensively for the other teams mm-hmm. because if they guard me with somebody my size or bigger, I had I did have enough ability to get to the basket. And then if they guarded me with somebody smaller, we did a lot of inverting where mm-hmm. at the time Alex Majeka, the center at 6'10", would pop out on the floor, which worked for him because he was a great 15-foot face-the-basket shooter. Yeah. And then I had a smaller guy down low, and then he could feed the ball down low or swing it to the wing and feed it down low. And then I was pretty good at uh, when I got around the basket of either scoring or getting fouled or both. Yeah, and you were a scorer. I mean, you you scored in a variety of ways. Like you mentioned, posting up, um, you had that baseline jumper that uh, you know seemed to be just golden, you know, for you. And and you got fouled a lot, so you got to the line. You made all your free throws. Um, but the one thing I think a lot of people have wondered is if a three point shot was in play at that time, how would that have changed your game? And would you have been a 30-point score, or, or would it have changed your game to not not well, to that degree? It would have. I would have added a few more points, I'm sure, because mm-hmm. I, I I shot some shots that certainly would have been three-point shots, but mm-hmm. it's not like I would have made 12 of them in a game. Sure. You know? But I think, I think the three-point line changed the game a lot and the way players play now is the mm-hmm. way we did back then. You know, for years it seemed like um, the three-point line, you either shot a three-point shot or you shot a dunk or a layup. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing in between. Without the three-point line, I think players back in my era were a lot more skilled at 
you know, maybe getting to the 12 foot line or the 15 foot line mm-hmm. and being able to pull up and shoot. Where today that seems to be a lost art. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and the one thing that stands out when I look at your stats um, is your shooting percentage. I mean, for a guy who did a lot of outside shooting, you were over 50% every year of your career. I think you were 56% as a junior. I mean, that's almost unheard of these days where a guard shoots that well. Well, a lot of that is, you know, uh, taking a lot of shots close to the basket, you Mm -hmm. know, being able to post up and use my body against a smaller guy to be able to get a pretty effective shot. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's what I say. I don't think I scored a ton more points because I was a perimeter shooter, but not necessarily just a plant the feet, catch and shoot. Yeah, I was more off the dribble, Mm -hmm. which got me probably more to the 15 foot range where I would take more shots than I probably would from outside the three point line. And you must have, must have been a pretty good driver to the basket too, to have gotten to the line as much as you did. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps to be, you know, to have been six seven against a, a lot of sure. guys were six two or six three. How and this is a question we could go on all day talking about how much the game has changed, but uh, you mentioned the three point shot has uh, has changed the game, the game immeasurably. What other areas in basketball? It's obviously a more physical <clears throat> game now. Way more physical and uh, much quicker than it used to be. Mm-hmm. You know, it's speed and explosiveness and leaping ability, strength, upper body strength, mm-hmm. lower body strength. It's just it it just increases over decades like tenfold, mm-hmm. and it's really changed a lot of the way the game is played. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more one on one type of play now mm-hmm. too, which is different from the way it was. We usually always ran some type of set. You know, we had positions where we were moving to, and then there were options off of all those things where mm-hmm. you might be a little bit creative on your own. But uh, yeah. today it's uh, just really a lot more one-on-one type play. And I'm not saying it makes the game better, not doesn't make it worse. It's mm-hmm. just the way it's developed into. Yeah, and you mentioned strength. Um, back in your day, weightlifting among basketball players was kind of frowned upon, wasn't it? Well, the theory back then was if you got too bulky, you would, wouldn't have the touch, right, which obviously right. is incorrect. <laughs> back then, we used to uh, take salt tablets without water, too, which is obviously <laughs> incorrect. Right. So a lot of things have been uh, revised over the years sure. that uh, that have changed the game drastically. But to me, size and quickness, I mean... You, you go today to uh, see it a little bit on television, but if you ever get a chance to go to an NBA game and sit down close, mm-hmm. maybe at the end of the end line or so where you're watching through the action, when you see 10 guys on a basketball court and it looks like there's no place to go because there isn't any room, right? you get a real sense of, of the size and the strength that's out there today. And the game, it was a simpler game back then in a lot of ways. Um, now you've got... Uh, the head coach and four assistants and yeah. <laughs> video guy. and I mean, you, the, yeah. there's more suits yeah. on the uh, bench than there are guys in uniform. Strength coaches year-round. Uh, right. Um, in your day, there was Coach Stoll, Coach Bisher. Coach Allen. And, Joe Allen. Yeah, yeah, and that was pretty much it. And yeah. and Coach Stoll, I remember him telling me he, he wrapped ankles before the game. and Well, he, he did because he was slightly better than uh, – than uh, Carl Gross, who was the basically <laughs> <laughs> worked in the field house. <laughs> right. Um, what was that like? I mean, to to have the coach so, I guess, ever present to, in your lives. Well, that's just the way it was. So yeah. I, you know, I don't know how to answer that because I've. Mm-hmm. That's just the way it always was. But uh, you know, he's a great guy. Everybody liked him. Everybody played hard for him because they wanted to. I'm sure there were guys who didn't like him because they didn't play enough that as sure. much as they thought, but that happens all the time. But yeah. uh, he was a huge influence over me at that time. And, you know, you're 18, 19, 20. That's a pretty impressionable time of year. A lot mm-hmm. of your things that your attitude, your work ethic, your moral capacity, mm-hmm. all of that can be is really – um, 
you t- you learn a lot of that during mm-hmm. that time frame and and he was a card everybody knows that but he he really was excellent at uh, molding individuals mm-hmm. such a great teacher of the game wasn't he he was a good teacher of the game mm-hmm. and he didn't mind doing it too mm-hmm. you know i he obviously took me under his wing but you know if i wasn't if practice was at 3 and i wasn't dripping wet with sweat at 2:30 i was late <laughs> <laughs> and the same thing afterward cuz cuz he liked to play too so he would always want to play you right, know, three right. on three games or sure, something like that, sure. and uh, he'd have a few guys in to play, and right. So we figured out early we need to let him win every once in a while because it made practice a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> well, if you're not early, you're late. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, and you had some great teammates. You mentioned Bobby Humbles. Um, you guys, um, I mean, what a what a backcourt duo because. Um, Obviously, when he moved to point guard, he was still a good scorer, and then he he was a guy who the three point line would have made a huge difference. I'm yeah. thinking he was he was probably a better perimeter shooter than I was. Mm-hmm. I was probably better inside a lot of that because of mm-hmm. uh, size. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, Alex Majeka was a uh, effective in the in the picture because of his ability to step out and let me go in. And uh, I, Mike Davis played with Mike Davis, played with Wayne McLean, played with. Uh, Dennis Smith played with Tom Les, mm-hmm. uh, Mark Doner, Greg Smith. A lot of, a lot of good names. A lot of fun. Just couldn't say enough about going to Bradley as opposed to maybe mm-hmm. going someplace else. And the Valley in those days was a beast. I mean, you had Louisville and Memphis and Cincinnati. Um, I mean, team St. Louis, St. Louis teams that have gone on to yep. bigger and better things. Um, and, and Bradley held its own. I mean, you guys didn't win championships, but you competed. Yeah, it was a really good league, mm-hmm. up and down. Um, a lot of fun places to play. Uh, seemed like the, the the games I've gone to now around the valley. You know, there's the attendance is down throughout the league somewhat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but back then, I mean, Bradley would sell out the field house almost every night we played there, but other schools did the same. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was it was fun to play in that type of atmosphere. Any favorite stories of the road or road games that uh, that stand out in your mind? I think, well, the one that stands out a couple actually. The night I broke Chet Walker's all-time scoring record, we were mm-hmm. in Wichita. And I was at the free throw line and Mm -hmm. uh, made the first one or second. I don't know which one it was, but they stopped the game Mm -hmm. to uh, announce that I had just broken the the school scoring record in Wichita, which was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, that night it was uh, the little uh, plastic or rubber balls, you know, that would say Wichita State Shockers on Mm -hmm. them. I think Bradley gives those away every once in a while, too, and they say Bradley Mm -hmm. Braves on them. Mm -hmm. Well, the students who all sat in that end zone around the thing started pelting their balls out onto the floor. (laughs) (laughs) And I just thought it was great. I loved it. Yeah. I love stuff like that. Yeah. And that was was one. And the last game I played in at Indiana State and uh, and, – they let coach go at halftime, announced mm-hmm. it on the radio that he was fired at mm-hmm. halftime. Yeah. And uh, we're like up one against Indiana State, who went on to phenomenal things that year. Right. And uh, I remember that one, too. That was a, that was a tough half. You guys were aware at, during the games? This we were not aware. Announced? Okay. No. Okay. But everybody else was. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and speaking of Indiana State, did you draw the assignment of uh, guarding Mr. Bird? No. I didn't, uh, thankfully. <laughs> you know, probably averaged 50. You're right. <laughs> but uh, they had, believe it or not, they had a great team. They had a, a guy by the name of Brad Miley who would guard me, and he mm-hmm. was, I'm telling you, he was as tough a defender as anybody I played at mm-hmm. at any level. I mean, he mm-hmm. was long and quick and mm-hmm. and didn't score much, so he was specifically a defensive mm-hmm. specialist and he was probably the toughest guy that uh okay. I faced yeah certainly in the uh in uh or had to try and score against in college for sure and then you move on to the NBA you're a first round draft 
choice of the Washington, were they the Bullets then? Yep. Um, and um, a six-year NBA career. Um, tell me a little bit about your NBA career. I mean, not not great numbers, but it looked like you had a couple of nice seasons in there. Yeah. You know, the, the biggest thing about that is you've got to play in professionally. You've got to be in a situation where they use you and then – you, ha- you you feel you have a role to be mm-hmm. successful, whether it's a big role or a small role. That's I think that's what everybody's looking for mm-hmm. when they they go and play professionally. Um, in Washington, they had just won the world title, had the exact same team coming back, mm-hmm. adding me and Dave Corzine as their first two choices uh, to the mix. Dick Mata was the head coach. He said, "We like you. Sit down." keep your ears open and your mouth shut. <laughs> and so that's basically what I did. Mm-hmm. And then uh, this my second year, um, and I didn't play much my, my, my first year, and I was even put mm-hmm. on the injured reserve halfway through the season. Mm-hmm. And then my second year, Kevin Grevy, a Kentucky guard who had been there for four or five years, got into a dispute with his contract after winning the title mm-hmm. and decided not to come to training camp which was an opening for me. Mm-hmm. So I stepped in and uh, started the first two games. I think I scored 14 or 15 at home. And then the next mm-hmm. day we went to the Garden in New York and I scored 35 against the Knicks. Mm. And the next day, Kevin Grevy was in uniform <laughs> <laughs> and being paid way more than they were paying right, me. Right. So he went back into the Did lineup. he ever thank you for... Uh... No, he didn't really. <laughs> But uh, and so I was back in the reserve role again. But mm-hmm. I think it it people saw enough of just a short period of time that mm-hmm. uh, I eventually got traded that year to New Jersey, which I, New Jersey was really going to be a good spot because they were just building the Meadowlands at that time. Mm-hmm. The time I was there, it was just a we were playing at Rutgers University. We practiced in Northern Jersey, and Rutgers is in. Piscataway, which was halfway down the state, and mm-hmm. the, the traffic to get to a home game was just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, mm-hmm. we'd be in a car two and a half, three hours going to a home game. Wow. So, and, and you come in from a road trip, and you got to play a home game that night. So you get in, you fight the traffic to go home, get some sleep, get up to fight traffic to go to a game. I mean, there's, there's a reason why that team wasn't very good at that mm-hmm. point in time, regardless of who their players were. Halfway through the season, you were just worn out physically. Mm-hmm. But then got traded to Cleveland, where I got my big break, I guess, and uh, went right into the starting lineup there and and played two and a half years there. Mm-hmm. And then they had some uh, personnel changes in the front office and whatnot. And then ended up getting traded to uh, San Antonio, which was a good move. I went from a team that wasn't very good to a team that was competing for the Western Conference champions mm-hmm. all the time. And uh, so that was fun. That was a, really a, a great place to live at that time, a great atmosphere. Really enjoyed that. Uh, Scott was born during that time. So uh, that was a, a really good point in my career that mm-hmm. I really enjoyed. George Gervin was the yeah, starting spent. guard, yeah. correct, You know, and he was leading the league in scoring every mm-hmm. year. And uh, so, again, my, my playing time suffered a lot, mm-hmm. which – then all of a sudden you don't really you don't see yourself in a role and and the other guys on the team don't see you in a role so that that makes it difficult that's the hard part about professional sports you're either on the way up or you're on the way down Mm -hmm. and then you finished in dallas did you did you play for dallas dick mata brought me back Uh to uh, dallas at the, the at the end of i got let go by san antonio um right before the playoffs started uh, Dick Mata, who was in Washington and drafted me, brought me in to, uh, to be the backup to Rolando Blackman. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he was another great player. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the first year that uh, the Mavericks made the playoffs, which was really kind of cool because yeah. they had never made it before. We played in Reunion Arena. They had always scheduled – the circus into town Mm -hmm. at the end of the season because the Mavericks (laughs) weren't going to be there. Right. Well, for once, all of a sudden, now we got a conflict of Mm -hmm. uh, where are we going to play these playoff games? So uh, we played... uh, Barton and Bailey wouldn't move, huh? No, they wouldn't move. (laughs) And we we played... We ended up... 
honest to God, there were debates on the radio, mm -hmm. and they were questioning the feasibility of asking the NBA if we could play our two home games against Seattle in the Cotton Bowl. Wow. They, <laughs> they said they had 700,000 requests for tickets for those two playoff games. We ended up playing in Moody Coliseum at SMU's campus. Uh huh. Six thousand five hundred seats. Oh my gosh! <laughs> this is when this is when oil was big, right? <laughs> can you can you imagine the, the money it took to get a ticket for one of those oh. two games? <laughs> wow! And then that concluded your career there. Yeah. Then after that, I had a chance to uh, to uh, go to uh, Milwaukee. Don Nelson was a coach at the time, mm -hmm. and I got. Out of the blue, I get this phone call from a uh, guy in Chicago mm -hmm. who represented guys around the league. I knew him because uh, Dave Corzine, a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. um, used him as his attorney to negotiate his contract. So he calls and he says, I think I got something you might like. It's on the south of France uh, in a town called Antibes, mm -hmm. next door to Nice. Says the pay's not great, but it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And the pay was pretty good because it includes your airfare back and forth. It includes a free place to live. It sure. includes a free car, free insurance. So everything's basically free. So other than what money you spend for fun, you're mm -hmm. banking everything that you make over there. Sure. Um, their schedule is uh, every Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> Just like high school. Mm -hmm. yeah, the whole league plays every Friday night and every Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And then if your team is good, you play in a World Cup, which, every, which is every Wednesday night. Okay. So, and they do that differently. You you play a season, mm -hmm. and then how you end the season this year determines whether or not you're in the World Cup next year. Okay. So the team before me qualified us to play in the World Cup, and then we went in as almost a completely different team. But okay. I really enjoyed them. Met a couple guys were really good friends. Mm -hmm. We were on the Riviera in the south of France, which you know was a small, quaint little town, mm -hmm. but really fun, really nice. People were great. A mm -hmm. uh, little bit of a language barrier, but uh, our team was unique. We had seven players on the team. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the league allows you to have two foreign players. Mm -hmm. So it was myself and uh, Mike Harper, who went to North Park College. Okay. About 6'10", thin, good player. Um, and then a, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Pierre Brissant, whose dad was in the military. He was born in France. So they determined after he played at Arizona State, he could be a French guy because he was born there. Sure. So they bring him in as a French player. Mm hmm uh, a guy by the name of Alan Bunting, who played at uh, San Diego State. And uh, he went over to Europe and was playing and ended up marrying a French girl. So mm -hmm. now all of a sudden and they turn qualified. him into he qualifies. <laughs> yeah. And then we had a, a, a guy by the name of Danielle Hackey, who was the was on the top of his career, heading on the downside. But mm -hmm. he was a like a 10-year French national player. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was our five guys that started and played the majority of the time. And, uh, you know, we all spoke English, and that didn't go over real well. And, <laughs> but, uh, and we lived in the south of France, and everybody sure. else was in the cold, and that didn't go over real well. Right. And so we were, you know, I, I told you, we're the Oakland Raiders of uh, French <laughs> basketball. That's funny. So um, sounds very idyllic. I mean, uh, wouldn't you want to spend more than one year there? Well, I would have, but that original phone call I got yeah. was, uh, you know, I'm in a, my in-law's kitchen in Crevecourt, Illinois, talking mm -hmm. to a guy in Chicago who's talking to a guy in New York, who's talking to a guy in Paris, who's talking to a guy in the south of France. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the line, it was lost that I wasn't 6'10". Because <laughs> <laughs> there's so, a lot of 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six guys. Sure, sure. That they can fill in. They have trouble finding that six, okay. ten, seven foot stud. Sure. Which sure. is what every team needs. All right. So that ended your basketball career. Yeah, and, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had an opportunity, which was even better, to play in Spain the year after that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the time, we everything we had, we just left there because we knew we were going back to Spain. Mm -hmm. Money was better. 
was a, supposedly in Barcelona, big city. When we played in the World Cup, we played in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like walking down Chicago or New York. You can find English magazines and newspapers and mm -hmm. a lot of people speak lots of languages. So we thought that was going to be a pretty good experience to move into a big city and all mm -hmm. that. So we left everything we had in storage in, in France, mm -hmm. came home, went back, got off the plane, you know, in France, not a lot of, back then especially, not a lot of people followed basketball. Our, our mm -hmm. building set, we, we packed it because we were good. Mm -hmm. And uh, But there was only like 10,000 people in the town during the winter. There was 300,000 in the summer with sure. all the resorts and condos and hotels. And, mm -hmm. But uh, but we had a good following. We, we would hold 4,000 people, and they would pack it every night. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you see it in Europe all the time. There's these wooden advertising signs around the mm -hmm. uh, the court. Well, everybody in the front row would hang over and bang their uh, their hands on the boards to make noise. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine, a, uh, you remember how loud the field house was? Sure. It was a pretty small building in comparison. We'll lower that ceiling by about 25 feet mm -hmm. and then put boards around the court and let people <laughs> bang on them. <laughs> It was a great well, home definitely. court atmosphere. You talk about <laughs> yeah. the other team not being yeah. able to understand each other when you're talking on the floor. That right. was that was the spot. Yeah. Well, um, you've had you've had a great experience in the game, and you know it's had to have made a big difference in your life. Yeah. Oh, you know, obviously, it's yeah. uh, shaped me for what I've become, and mm -hmm. and uh, just grateful for all of it, and had some really great honors and. Some great, great guys, and you know, I'm a big believer in that. You can uh, learn a lot through sports, a lot about life through sports, not only the good but also the bad. And, but how to deal with the good in a gracious manner, and how to deal with the bad without it ruining your life. So, great. Well, that's our show today. Our thanks to guests Roger Fegley, Bradley Hall of Famer, <laughs> Greater Peoria Sports Hall of Famer, and Missouri Valley Conference Hall of Famer. I think a few years ago. So. Yep. Uh, uh, I don't know if there's any more uh, Hall of Famers that are going to come calling, but uh, that's quite a <laughs> quite a list right there. So thanks again for joining us, Roger. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay. That wraps up today's uh, podcast. If you want to subscribe to the Journal Star, give us a call at 686-3161. That's all for now. Thanks for coming.